uh, policy or, for that matter, intellectual opinion. In fact, it's so remote that the press won't even report the facts. كيف تواجهون الدعاية التي تمارسها وسائل الإعلام الأمريكية المتأثرة بجو الإدارة الأمريكية والتي تؤثر بشكل كبير على الرأي العام الأمريكي ولا لعبت دور أساسي بإقناع أغلبية الأمريكيين أن العراق مثلا يشكل التهديد المباشر للولايات المتحدة ما هو دوركم في إعادة يعني تموضع وسائل الإعلام الأمريكية التي تأخذ بعض الأحيان مواقف منحازة Well, first of all, the U.S. media are not very different from media elsewhere, despite illusions. Uh, the United States Hold happens on. to be a very free society, the most free society in the world. Uh, the government has no power to coerce the media. Anything they do, they do by their own choice, which is a very good situation. It took a long time to win that freedom, hundreds of years, but it's there. So what the media do is their choice. Now, the media happen to be huge corporations, parts of even bigger corporations. They're very closely linked to the main sectors of corporate power, which is the dominant internal force in the United States. All of that's closely linked to government. So there's a pretty tight linkage, informal linkage, between the corporate sector, including the media, uh, and the government. And, the, and furthermore, the general intellectual community tends to support power. Well, that's a historical tendency everywhere, including the United States, every other country I know about. So the general effect is that the media more or less reflect the position of state power and corporate power. There are exceptions. You get criticism, and it's not 100 percent, but that's the general picture. In the case of Iraq, which you mentioned, uh, the, uh, in September 2002, the government essentially announced the invasion of Iraq. It was pretty close to that. Uh, Condoleezza Rice uh, started giving speeches uh, saying the next thing we hear from Saddam Hussein will be a mushroom cloud in New York. He's going to bomb New York with nuclear weapons. Uh, he's supporting Al-Qaeda. He was responsible for 9-11 and so on. And the media picked up the propaganda. Within a month, one month, the U.S. population was driven completely off the international spectrum. Um, people may have hated Saddam Hussein everywhere, but nobody was afraid of him. Uh, people didn't think he was going to bomb them tomorrow. Uh, in the United States, a majority of the population came to believe that Saddam Hussein is an imminent threat to the people of the United States. And if you look at the polls, those beliefs correlate very closely with support for the war as you'd expect. Well, that happens over and over. Uh, right now, a large majority of the population regards Iran as the main threat to the United States. Sorry. Why? Is it because objectively it's a threat to the United States? No. It's because there is a huge government media campaign frightening the population into that belief. And this goes far back. I mean, it may be hard to believe, but in 1985, uh, President Reagan declared a national emergency in the United States because of the threat to the security of the United States posed by the government of Nicaragua, uh, which was only two days uh, driving time away from Texas. So in two days, the Nicaraguan army could be invading the United States. I mean, this is so ludicrous. You don't know whether to laugh or cry. Uh, but it was a national emergency, and the population was frightened. That's the way governments control their own populations. They control one of the main methods for controlling the population is fear, inspire fear. And the media play a role in that. They also shape the discussion uh, in such a way that people don't perceive what's happening. A very striking example right now is the Israel-Arab conflict. No. Uh, Israel is, with U.S. backing, the United States and Israel are now, in effect, annexing the valuable parts of the West Bank. That's presented as withdrawal. Uh, if you read the New York Times editorials, they're praising Israel for withdrawing from the West Bank, referring to the policy by which it's annexing the West Bank. Well, that's close to 100% of discussion. So, yes, that's what people believe. 
بروفيسور تشومسكي بدقيقة واحدة أريد الإجابة دقيقة واحدة فقط أنت يهودي وتعرف عن نفسك بأنك كنت ناشطا صهيونيا في شبابك ويتهمونك بأنك معاد للسامية كيف تدافع عن نفسك دقيقة واحدة Actually, that that notion has origins in the Bible, and I'm happy to accept the uh, criticism. The origins in the Bible are King uh, Ahab, who was the epitome of evil in the Bible, and he condemned the prophet Elijah for being a hater of Israel. The reason Elijah was a hater of Israel was because he was criticizing the acts of the evil king. And the king, like totalitarians throughout history, identified the state himself with the people, the country, and the culture. So if you criticize state policy, you're a hater of Israel, or a hater of America, or a hater of Russia, or any other country you like. So yes, I'm delighted to be in that company. ولكن ألا تعتقد الأمر طبيعي عندما تصف الممارسات الإسرائيلية أو الشبه الإسرائيليين بهتلر؟ ألا تعتقد وصفك بمعاداة سامية أمرا طبيعيا هنا؟ I have never described Israeli policies as being like Hitler or anyone else's policies as being like Hitler. Hitler was unique. It's a historically unique, uh, 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 hideous uh, uh, development in human affairs. I don't think anyone is like it. On the other hand, I do say that some of the policies announced happen to be very similar to those no. of Hitler. So Hitler's, I quoted Hitler's remarks when he took over Czechoslovakia, you know, they're familiar from every other great power. And we should recognize that. That's not to say that everyone else is committing the Holocaust. No, of course they're not. That was unique. Uh, but we should recognize uh, similarities in planning, policies, and thinking when they are real. باختصار كان معنا المفكر البروفيسور 